All right, here we are. I'm going to be bringing in both uh, Kathy Martin for about 15 minutes and Bryce Zabel. Welcome. Thanks so much for uh, being on board for this uh, this show. I really appreciate both of you here. Well, and we're on board because it's the 60th anniversary. Yeah. So, I, Bryce, do you want to? Well, first of all, uh, you've been on several times. I just, I have to ask this every time because I have so many new listeners every single week. Just if you both can do just a real quick um, nutshell of who you are. Hmm. I'll let Kathy go first on that. <laughs> <laughs> who are you, Kathy? Tell us. <laughs> well, to begin with, I'm the niece of Betty and Barney Hill and the major researcher on the case. Uh, have done years and years of research and with Stanton Friedman wrote, captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience. I've written four additional books and I'm working on another one. Uh, I was MUFON's director of experiencer research for 10 years and have recently stepped down and uh, continue with my research and investigation. Yeah. And you do a wonderful job. And yeah. you just received an award. So Yes, yeah. I did. I received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International UFO Congress. Congratulations. That Thank was awesome. You. Yeah. And Bryce Zabel from California. I, listen, I'm jealous of Kathy getting a Lifetime <laughs> Award because I'm no spring chicken anymore. And I still don't have a Lifetime Achievement Award. So, you know, I'm in a good word for you someday. Listen. Um, well, I started out as a CNN correspondent, became an investigative reporter for PBS, and then uh, sort of flipped over to the dark side and went to work in Hollywood, uh, where I've, on the ufological paranormal point of view, uh, I created the NBC series Dark Skies, which is uh, uh, on Tuesday, the 21st of September, celebrating its 25-year anniversary. I uh, worked on the Crow Stairway to Heaven, which is about the afterlife, of course. I wrote the first uh, uh, original film for the Sci-Fi Channel, something called Official Denial, which was about the uh, UFO cover-up and the fact that the aliens and that weren't aliens, but were humans from the future. And uh, worked on Taken with Steven Spielberg, um, have several projects uh, under option, but the one that's most relevant to today, of course, is um, Kathy's wonderful book, Captured, is under option by uh, my production company and my wife and I have been developing it and we are out in the market with it right now, trying to turn that uh, terrific book into uh, a 10 part television series, a one hour drama series. So lots of things going on, but that's kind of the short, uh, short spin. Although I actually have one other thing that I think is kind of, since we're talking anniversaries and you've got the 60th of the Betty and Barney um, abduction and you got the 25th of dark skies, this year, I also kind of went through something that was very personal, which was the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And I was the, um, I'd just been elected chairman and CEO of the Television Academy uh, just a few weeks before. So literally, a job that I thought was going to be some easy gig turned into a very, very difficult one and, and probably one of the more extreme things that I've ever experienced in my professional life. Now, if I remember right, Bryce, maybe I have this wrong, but were they actually canceled that year? Oh, yeah. Listen, there have been 49 Emmys up until 2001, and they had never been canceled or postponed. In my first two months on the job, I canceled and postponed them twice. Um, mm. The interesting part of it, of, of course, is that the first Emmys were supposed to take place on September 16th, 2001, which seemed outrageous and impossible after the 9-11 attacks. So we postponed them. We picked a date frankly, just based on the avail availability of the Shrine Auditorium, uh, which turned out to be October 7th. On uh, that morning, we invaded Afghanistan. So we had to postpone them a second time. Oh. And then we finally did them on November 4th of 2001. And they ran against the seventh game of a very exciting World Series. So they, they were not the Emmys that, they were not my grandfather's Emmys. They were <laughs> certainly new and unusual. Yeah, you got through it though, right? Yeah. Wow. Oh. Amazing. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's talk about uh, Kathleen. Can you believe it's been sixty years? I, I remember can't. It's you remember up. that event. Incredible. <laughs> it's yes. really, really something. And uh, 
Bryce, let's talk quickly. I read your articles or breeze yeah. through them. Um, I, I, I'm surprised. And, and I, I don't know if you probably knew every single thing that's in that one of the articles. Yeah. Um, uh, Kath, Kathleen, I'm talking to you um, because, mm -hmm. but I was, uh, the way you wrote that, it is surprising that it took that long, 1965, before the first article was written, because they were talking about it. You know, I mean, it did, you know, just, it's amazing because the way things go, like a neighbor can, I mean, just you say something to one neighbor and the neighbor can blab and then it gets into the press somehow. So it is quite amazing it took that that long. Well, it's they talked to the family and we were sworn to secrecy to UFO investigators confidentially, to uh, members of the Air Force and the Navy, uh, and to people at their church and their close friends. But they had, well, also scientists, but they had never intended to have this story go public because of their positions in the state of New Hampshire and also because they had an interracial marriage and they were very committed to working uh, on equal rights and human rights. And and Bryce, so why don't you talk about how it was Luttrell? How do you say his? Luttrell, John Luttrell yeah. Sr. Yeah. Uh, you know, listen, one of the things that has happened is by optioning uh, Kathy's book and then trying to develop for a television series, <clears throat> that would be in success. Uh, a minimum of say 10 hours of television. So uh, there has to be a story that exists outside of the Betty and Barney abduction because that can be handled in a relatively expeditious way. There has to be the aftermath to it. And of course there's a lot of aftermath to it. Um, but I started kind of doing a deep dive into it. I started reading everything I could get my hands on and, and, and sort of asking myself, how did this come to pass and what are the things that I could uh, that would provide grist for good uh, storytelling in a dramatic series. And one of the things I, I came across is that uh, many people believe that the Betty and Barney Hill story began uh, with the Interrupted Journey book that John Fuller wrote. And then that became, of course, the um, UFO Experience movie in 1975. Well, the Fuller book came out in 66, but that's not really where it started. And of course, Kathy knows this and she was just referencing that. What happened is that in uh, 1965, this uh, John Fuller, who was an invest, an award-winning investigative reporter for a paper called the Boston Traveler, uh, published a series of articles about the Hill case uh, that broke in the Boston Traveler. And, uh, and a full year before the Fuller book came out, a ricocheted around the world and got everybody's attention. Now, obviously the book, The Interrupted Journey, a year later got even more attention, but it started with John Fuller. And <clears throat> I know Kathy and I, we've, if the, we agree on like 99% of, of things, but on this one, we sort of come at it from a slightly different point of view. I guess my take is that while I know Betty and Barney wanted to remain, um, uh, you know, they wanted this to remain among them and the people they chose it to be with. I know as an investigative reporter myself that that's a good intention, but I can see very easily how John Luttrell managed to get the story. I mean, you talk about uh, telling the family not to talk to anybody except uh, Kathy, your own mother, uh, spoke to, uh, you know, um, the, I'm trying to think she, oh yeah, she's talked to the Newton, New Hampshire chief of police within a day or two. She not talked to a physicist day. within a day or two. Yeah, he was my father's best friend in Stockton. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, and I, I'm just following up on what Martin said. Yeah. So let's, let's just, I just ask your listeners to believe, uh, to consider this for a second. Martin, I walk up to you and I go, man, do I have a story I need to tell you? And you go, what is it? And I go, all right, well, look. And then I tell you the story and I say, whatever you do, man, this has got to stay between you and me. And you say, okay, of course. Then you go home that night and you say to your wife, I got to tell you this story that Bryce Abel just laid on me. It was pretty amazing. And you tell her and you say, but whatever you do, you can't tell anybody else. And she goes, of course I won't. And then, of course, she does. That's how stories kind of get out there. And so it began with Betty and Barney uh, uh, talking to the family. Uh, I believe they also told the upstairs renters on that same day, but they filed uh, reports as Kathy properly mentioned, first with the Peace Air Force people that became Project Blue Book. 
And just because you file a report some with someone doesn't guarantee a confidentiality. Everybody at Blue Book, of course, and Peace Air Force Base were trying to uh, track down whether this was a, an accurate description of the event and what it might mean. So other people were spoken to. They also filed a report with NICAP, the um, National Investigations Committee for Aerial Phenomena. And of course, many people from NICAP found out about it. Several of them, besides the people they filed it with, came to the the Hill House and talked to them about it. Betty talked to many of, or not many, but several of her co-workers, it appears. They also spoke to a number of medical professionals. Uh, on November 23rd, 1962, this is just one year after the event, the Hills spoke to a discussion group at their church, which was a number of people. They spoke again on September 7th, 1963. And then the big one for why it broke and why an investigative reporter would have got his hands on it is on November 3rd, 1963. Uh, this is two years before he would actually break the story. The Hills told their story in public before 200 different people uh, at a public gathering of a UFO uh, research group, the, uh, a working group. So I guess my point is, there was this story out there in the in the in the world, and John uh, Latrell, being an award-winning investigative reporter, had heard about it, and he tried to track it down. And so, what's been unfair to his work over the years, in my opinion, is simply that uh, people don't know about it, or if they know about it, they sort of make it feel like he was some kind of unethical guy that leaked this story. Well, he didn't leak a story. Reporters do not leak stories. Reporters report stories. If anybody leaked the story, it might be the friends, the family, the, the people who wrote the reports, uh, the people who were at these public events. They might have leaked it to John Luttrell, but Luttrell was just doing his job. He was, he was telling a story about something that he felt was of public interest. And I'll close with this. Uh, the public interest aspect of, of journalism, which is something I was taught at um, journalism school at the University of Oregon, was, you know, is it is it important? It, you know, does it trump, does the public interest trump the right of privacy in some cases? And of course it does in this case, because let's say that Betty and Barney were the first people ever to be abducted, uh, or at least in the United States to report on it. Um, and that this was part of something nefarious. I mean, who knows at the time, but it certainly didn't seem right that people were being taken out of their cars and, and brought on board a spacecraft for some kind of uh, in, uh, medical exam. Then I would say John Luttrell uh, did the world a favor by breaking that story because it's a matter of public interest to all of us today. Are, are UFO abductions real? And if they are real, uh, what is the intent of them? Because uh, we want to know if we're safe. So I look at John Luttrell as kind of a, a, a character that's been sort of discarded in the history of ufology, but who shouldn't have been. I look at him as a guy who did, uh, who did strong, good work and should be remembered for it. Uh, Kathy, do you have anything to uh, comment on about that? I do. I, I want to uh, state that in that presentation on November 3rd, 1963, uh, Betty and Barney had not even begun their hypnosis with Dr. Simon. That began in 1964. And so they were not on the speaking docket at that meeting. They were trying to learn more from people who knew something. And so they went to this meeting and then people who knew them asked them to stand up and, and say a few words about their UFO sighting. And then from what I have read, Betty spoke briefly about her dreams, uh, some of her dreams, and, and that was it. So in John Luttrell's article, he somehow acquired the information that was on Betty's and Barney's confidential hypnosis tapes. This was, uh, these were medical records for held by their psychiatrist, Dr. Benjamin Simon, who had uh, seen Barney as a primary patient because Barney had developed psychogenically induced uh, bleeding ulcers, high blood pressure. He had been hospitalized uh, because of this and his symptoms would not recede with traditional medical treatment. Dr. Simon had 
in, invented uh, a new way of dealing with the psychogenically induced traumatic experiences that result in physiological problems during his work with soldiers during World War II. He was a lieutenant colonel in the army and he set up the psychiatric unit at the Mason General Hospital on Long Island. And this is where he developed this technique that he used very successfully. In fact, the movie Let There Be Light, a John Huston movie was made about Dr. Simon's work. And it showed him working with soldiers and uh, how they improved and finally got on the bus and, and went home to their families. So he was the perfect person for Barney to see. These tapes were to remain uh, medical records in, in Dr. Simon's uh, possession. Betty and Barney at some point ended up with the real, some real to real tapes. And so, but they had not released this information to anyone except for uh, maybe Laurie D'Alessandro, who John Luttrell named in a letter that he wrote in August of 1965, saying to Betty and Barney that uh, if they were nearly as nice as their friend Laurie D'Alessandro was, that he would love to meet them, and that uh, this uh, would was probably the, the best UFO sighting case that had ever occurred. Well, Betty and Barney uh, did not want to meet him. In fact, uh, he went up to their house and they left that house. They went to my grandparents' house and I was there because I lived across the street and my parents were there and they were distressed because there was a new newspaper reporter on their trail. Then- uh, Good for him. <laughs> yeah. Good for him. Well, then uh, he published these five articles in the Boston Traveler, and this was devastating to Betty and Barney. They went to my grandparents' house again, and we met as a family. What should they do? This, I mean, they had no idea when they were confiding in people that this would ever be made public. In 1965, Barney had been uh, elected to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights State Advisory Committee. They'd been invited to Lyndon Johnson's inauguration. Barney had received an award from Sergeant Shriver for his work on the federal poverty program. And he had received uh, an award from the Archdiocese of Manchester, New Hampshire, for setting up a literacy program for people in New Hampshire because you had to take a literacy test to vote. Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. She was working with Barney on all of these things, and he was the director of the NAACP in his area as well. This is something that was terribly shocking to them when this occurred, they didn't see it coming. And, um, you know, maybe John Luttrell was a great uh, reporter, but in that letter, he said to Betty and Barney, he wrote, if you will talk to me about this, I promise you that I will not commercialize on your story in any way. How is reporting a story commercializing it? He didn't make a dime from it. Uh, Kathy, the person who made money from it was John Fuller, who wrote a book and got paid for the book and got paid for the movie. So, uh, and so he didn't, John Luttrell simply did his job as a reporter. Anyway, I'll let you finish, but I'd like to jump in when you, when, when yeah, there's a chance. Well, um, this is what he said. It, it appeared in the Boston Traveler for five days. It was terribly shocking to what? Betty and Barney. And that is when we met as a family this was going to have an impact on the entire family. And a lot of people in the family were very upset. Of course they were. Like, listen, being devastated yeah. or upset is not the standard of whether a, a, a reporter can report something. Um, many yeah, people are devastated when somebody reports about them, whether they are mob figures or just the person down the street who pulled a cat out of a tree. 
uh, they may not want it to be reported on. I mean, so that's not the standard. And Betty and Barney, uh, well, I totally sympathize with them. I'm writing a very sympathetic treatment about these people. But while I, I sympathize with them, you know, they don't control confidentiality, all right? If you tell somebody something, you control the confident, you know, you, obviously you have an expectation that conversations you have with your lawyer or with your doctor are probably not going to go out. But let's remember this, all right? The big complaint here is that, um, you know, n that those hypnosis tapes weren't uh, something that he should have had access to. And so therefore that's why it's implied that he leaked it. He didn't leak anything. He didn't steal hypnosis tapes. I mean, someone gave John Luttrell access to those tapes or transcripts. That's the only way he would have had it to include in that article. And I'll point out mm -hmm. one other thing that I found in my investigation. The NICAP report, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, that had the 60 page version, not the initial shorter one, but the 60 page version that did include hypnosis um, and discussions about the hypnosis came out several months before the article. And again, someone gave that NICAP report to John Luttrell. That doesn't make him unethical. It doesn't make uh, his work improper. He did a, a, a stellar job of journalism because people gave it to him. And you say, well, well, I don't know, they shouldn't have given it to him. Well, you know what, what about the Pentagon Papers? Uh, they were not supposed to be given for publication, but they were. And the public interest in having the Pentagon Papers actually uh, uh, printed uh, has been demonstrated time and again in, in American history. The intent uh, of, the, of the people who had access to them probably wasn't that it should show up in the New York Times, but, but that's what happened. So. I just, uh, I just, I think I just look at this. Look, I understand the family would be upset. I would be upset. I understand that Betty and Barney uh, certainly, if if they hoped that this would never ever get out, they were naive. And let's face it, why should they not be naive about that? Because they, you know, it's not their life. I mean, that wasn't their life up to that point. Of course, they're going to uh, hope for the best. But many, 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 many people knew about their case enough to get John Luttrell looking into it. And he did go to Betty and Barney and ask them to participate. They said, no, we, we prefer not to. Well, that's not the end of it. The fact that the person you're trying to write a story about says, I prefer you not write a story about me. If that was the standard of journalism, then there'd be a lot less journalistic articles that had ever been written. What John Luttrell did is say, well, I wish you'd reconsider that. Um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about this case. And then since they didn't want to talk to him, he went out and started talking to the friends that Betty and Barney had told their story to. He went out and tracked down. He had copies for those articles of both the Peace Air Force Base Project Blue Book report. He had a copy of the NICAP report, and he had copies of the transcripts from uh the hypnosis sessions. He did not go out and steal those in the dark of night. People gave them access to those things, knowing that him as a reporter who was working on the story would, would pull from them in the writing of his story. And I would argue, looking back on it now, the John Luttrell articles have one standard the guy is applying. He's saying, well, what happened and what what facts do I have before me that I can marshal into this story? And again, writing a story is not commercializing on it, all right? That's journalism. So he didn't commercialize it. He wrote a story about it based on the facts that he had. Now, what did John Fuller do? This is the second guy, the guy that wrote The Interrupted Journey. He left things out of the interrupted journey specifically because he didn't want to offend people. In some cases, he didn't want to offend uh, Barney. In some cases, he didn't want to offend the psychiatrist. In some cases, he, his publishers said, don't put these things in the book. So he left out facts. So I would argue, if you're gonna put John Luttrell up there and John Fuller, as a journalist, I'm voting for John Luttrell. John Luttrell went after the story, did his damned best to report it as accurately as he possibly could. And given that it went out, you know, it's just a shame that those articles aren't collected for more people to read because they were the first time people got to read about Betty and Barney's case. And he did nothing wrong. He wasn't unethical. 
He should get an award for it. And in fact, if we ever name an award for uh, UFO journalism, I would submit it should be called the John Luttrell UFO Journalism Award because he did a great job. And and I say all that with with uh, you know great respect for Kathy, who I I I adore you, Kathy. You're a fantastic person. I enjoy your book, and I've I've optioned it. I'm trying to bring it to life, but. The fact that Betty and Barney were upset that the story came out in 1965 is not the controlling fact of journalism. It's just not. Mm -hmm. I was very angry with John Luttrell for many, many years. But recently, uh, before Stanton passed away, he gave me a letter that he had written to John Luttrell and John had uh, responded to where he said that he had investigated that case in the White Mountains, and he had found tw at least 12, 12 yes. 14 witnesses. Which has so helped you over the years, hasn't I it? I have to forgive him over that, because he did do the investigation. He did find witnesses. And this is very important. Yeah, Kathy, that, I... I, I, I I think that's a, a point of commonality for us here, to be honest with you. I, I, again, know how it hurts. I mean, I would be hurt if it was my family. I get it. I mean, I totally, totally get it. But the commonality here is if you're trying to find, I know that it is your interest to get the truth about the Betty and Barney case out there. And, you know, something that uh, Luttrell did that John Fuller did not do is exactly what you pointed out. John Luttrell put on a pair of, solid shoes and went out and expended shoe leather to try to find out what happened. And he found active witnesses. Now, those witnesses were not uh, quoted in his articles, ironically, which I, I, it's a huge irony to me, but they weren't quoted because the newspaper thought, well, the witnesses that he found don't aren't actually saying you know, anything about what happened to Betty and Barney. And that's what we want the, the articles to be about. But those witnesses have been very useful to you over the years, even just knowing that they exist. And they're interesting. I see you're scrolling this first article I wrote about it. I mean, one of the things I do in there is say, you know what, if you're one of those witnesses or you're the, the son or daughter of one of those witnesses or a grandson or granddaughter of one of those witnesses, you would help the world right now if you came forward and told us what you know. And I'm sure that you've been doing the same thing, Kathy, as well you should. And um, I, I, I say um, witnesses, whether they came from John Luttrell or yourself or someone out of the blue right now, are the bread and butter of, of testimony. And I'm, I'm glad that, that those were provided. I, I sleep better at night on this story, knowing that you've been following them up. And, and I think that is a point where we are solid as a rock on. I agree with that, Bryce. And uh, I have looked for witnesses over many, many years. Uh, there were people who in upstate New Hampshire who spoke with me, who had UFO sightings in the same time frame but I wasn't able to pin them down to knowing that it was the same night. I had even one individual tell me that a craft had landed on their farm that night, but that wasn't the area where Betty and Barney right. were taken. Um, I spoke to a, a man who was in the Navy. He's retired now, but he was in the Navy during that time frame. He was in Maine as a young man on that night, and he has written testimony uh, and signed and sworn to it that he saw the craft. He had a friend with him. Both of them saw a craft that night moving in the direction of where Betty and Barney were. So that is at the University it's of New Hampshire in the archival collection now. And and frankly, it's, it's incredible because it does help both, I mean, look, uh, We've taken a little diversionary path down here on the Latrell thing, but the truth of the matter is we're here right now on your show, Martin, for one reason. It was 60 years ago on September 19th, going into the morning of September 20th, that Betty and Barney had something extraordinary happen to them. And to the extent that anybody was taking it seriously and trying to uh, get that information uh, was probably a good thing. So I would just let me just add, try to bring a little closure here in so that because I don't the last thing I would want anybody to think is that Kathy and I are anything other than on the same team here, because here's the here's the thing. 
I'm willing to stipulate for, for Kathy quite clearly that if I was Betty or Barney or herself or her family or her friends or anybody, it wouldn't have been a great thing to wake up on the morning of October 25th, 1965 and read those articles. That would be hard. OK, and we've all been through hard times in our lives with our families. And when you've gone through something that's particularly shocking, such as this, to, to have to read about it and realize, OK, this has now changed my life. OK, because now it's not a secret to to anybody anymore. It's out there. That would be tough. And I'm sure Kathy, it seems like Kathy is saying the same thing on the other side, which is, you know, um, while we didn't love it and and uh, and all that, that the contribution that he made, if, if we're only applying truth as a standard, is he actually tried a little more to be a truth teller than even the guys that did the guy that did the book. So I, I feel like we're we're not we're not apart. Are we? We're not really that far apart, are we, Kathy? I think we're, we're pretty not that far apart. But I'm speaking from the point of view of a family member yes. who lived it. You're and I'm speaking from right. the point of view as a journalist. Yes. And See, that's, that's the thing. And, yeah. and you know what? I think it's right and proper um, on any major issue. And this is certainly when you talk about ufology. I mean, the reason you and I even know each other is because I, I am so profoundly uh, impacted by this story that I wanted to know more about it. So uh, there are a lot of different ways to look at these things. But when you get into a big story like the Betty and Barney story, um, it's important to put it all on the table at this point. And in fact, the way I look at it is it's 60 years later. So, you know, we're not offending anybody 60 years later. Now is the time to say, Ali Ali income free if there's if there's witnesses or family members of witnesses. And it's also time to say, you know, um, the hard feelings of, of the past about anything, the, the people who are feeling them are are past, you know. Mm -hmm. And so now the question is, is the Betty and Barney case, which is now 60 years in the past, does it have a relevance for today? And is it aiming toward the future? And I, th I think it is, and that is the number one reason why I'm so passionate to bring this story to another group of people, because I feel like it should not be forgotten. And then I'll close with this about why it should not be forgotten and why I hope we make it. Um, as Be as uh, Kathy just pointed out, Betty and Barney are an interracial couple in 1961. And Martin, that's pretty crazy, because everywhere they went, even though it was better in New Hampshire than Selma, Alabama, it doesn't mean that people didn't look at them weird and 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 that they did. And Barney didn't encounter racism and so forth. So I think that the the thing that's interesting about their case now is not only is it a it's a first, it's the first UFO abduction reported in America. It's the first case of missing time. It's the first use of hypnosis. And it's the first description of the grays. That makes it a pretty great case. But at the same time, it is also a story about America, a story about race in America at a time when we've been having the Black Lives Matter protests. And so it really takes the UFO issue and the race issue, which nobody ever thought belonged in the same thing, and put them in an atom collider to take a look at them. And, and when we finally make this 10-part series, if we're, if we're I'm knocking on wood, if we're lucky enough to make it, that's how we're going to look at it, that at a time in America where everybody saw the color of their skin, the only people who seemed not to see the color of their skin were these aliens that abducted them. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Yes. About that. Um, Kathy, I know you've stayed a lot longer than you were planning to. Uh, yes. And I'd just like to mention, Martin, to the listening audience that uh, Captured has been updated. There's a 30, uh, 60th anniversary edition with new scientific evidence and new information. Yeah. Excellent. It's All right. Good Thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's been My a real pleasure. pleasure. Thank Bye you. Bye, Bye Kathy. Uh, yeah. It, very interesting. And uh, it is, I, I totally get how you can have two different perspectives of this. She's, there's the emotional aspect of it yes. and then you're seeing it you know from the journalist aspect aspect of it one of the things i want to ask you bryce um we'll talk about other things as well we have uh i think about 20 minutes left um but you mentioned that fuller spoke 
um, you, you know, had to leave some things out is what yeah. I mean yeah. in the book. Can you give, uh, do you have any examples you can yeah, give I do. us? Uh, okay. And by the way, I just want to make one thing clear. I am speaking as a trained journalist about the journalism aspect, but in many respects, it's Kathy's uh, ability to feel the inner family emotion that is what's driving me as a dramatist. I mean, if I'm lucky enough to get to write 10 hours of, uh, of a television uh, limited series, it isn't going to just be about the journalism. So in other words, it wouldn't be just about, ju you know, I mean, even if there is a, a storyline where John Fuller is putting the heat on them and trying to break their story, it's the emotional part that would impact me. In other words, I would imagine that Betty and Barney, while that was going on, were freaking out. Uh, knowing that that this thing that they thought was contained wasn't going to stay contained. All right, yeah. so now examples of what Fuller uh, did. Um, I don't have them all in front of me at this point, um, but I think actually I do um, have, I, if you'll bear with me for just a second, um, I think I have them right here in front of me. Now, you and I have talked while you're looking, you and I yeah. have talked about this when you were on in the past. And so if I remember right, it seemed like you you and I were talking about this three years ago, maybe even yeah. longer. So yeah. you've been on this thing pretty pretty deeply. I'm on the hunt. Okay, actually, I do have uh, an example. Uh, for example, um, Betty and Barney had a gun in the car, right? And mm -hmm. um, and that's now fact. That's established fact, Kathy. It's in her book, et cetera. Um, but that's not what Fuller reported. He said Barney went and got a, a tire iron out of the car. Because right, that's in the movie, right? right? To report yeah. about a, a gun. Well, you know what? I'm sorry. It was a gun. You should have written gun, not tire iron. That's a fact error, right? Mm. And I don't I don't approve of that. Here's another one. Um, he didn't want to admit that Barney, all, we know that Betty was looked at to see if she was pregnant, right? So there was that sexual aspect of that. And he didn't want to because I don't know if it was race or sex or whatever, but he didn't want to say that Barney had had a sperm sample taken. All right. And so he left it out. Hmm. He wrote around it. OK. But to me, if you're trying to understand why would an alien take two people and conduct a medical experiment if the male had been ejaculated, which is what happened? I'm sorry if it's offensive to talk about it, but that's what happened. And he left it out. And that's a pretty major thing. Then there was also a letter um, that was uh, written to NICAP. I believe it's NICAP um, that discusses the possibility of hypnosis. And he decided, well, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin my lead. So I'm going to take that out. Right. So those are three <laughs> examples of things. Now, uh, John Fuller, uh, because he was commercial, okay. As opposed to the opposite, he was trying to write a commercially successful book. Right. And so he had a publisher, uh, dial press, and those publishers were all over him about, well, don't say this and don't say that. Plus, he was trying to keep Betty and Barney happy. And of course, they probably had their own feelings about what should or should not be in the book. And he had to keep Benjamin Simon, the hypnotherapist, the psychiatrist happy. And so I can only imagine because I'm a person who's had to write a lot of things over the years with network notes and studio notes. And I know what it's like to get notes, right? It's not fun. And it's difficult to reconcile them and get everybody on the same page. So what happened when John Fuller was writing that book, The Interrupted Journey, that became what most people think is how the whole thing started, um, he had a hell of a time reconciling all the different ways that people were seeing this. So anyway, that's that's one take. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, when, when the... I, I, I can sort of, you know, I'm not giving him a pass by saying this, but I can see back in the time in the sixties, you know, when this book was written, where right. those things were, those things were more controversial of then course. than I think they are now. Of, of, of course. I mean, yeah. uh, but, uh, and, and in fact, I only, I don't bring it up in a condemning context for the guy. I bring it up in trying to set the record straight. These two articles that you've been kind enough to scroll. And I hope somehow if there's a, place to put the URLs in for people. Oh yeah, they're in the they're in the show that notes. That would be awesome. Yeah. Because yeah. 
What I tried to do is just say, look, we're, it's the 60th anniversary. We're getting to the end of the, of the line here for new discoveries, right? Yeah. And, and I think it's time to put things into as much context as we can. So I tried to do that with each article. I mean, uh, I, I'll give you an example. Um, for 60 years, people have sort of looked at the Betty and Barney case as a duality, as a binary choice. Either they were abducted by aliens or they're big fat liars. Okay, mm -hmm. pick one. Mm -hmm. But what if it wasn't that? You know, what if they were targeted? Who might have targeted them? Um, are there other explanations for how somebody could think that they were abducted that didn't involve aliens? I mean, the reason I'm bringing that up is that in the script that I'll be writing, in the scripts that I'll be writing uh, in, in success, um, the first thing you think of is not in 1961, I guess we were taken by aliens. You know, Barney was a pretty pragmatic guy. He served in World War II. He'd be saying to himself, there's got to be another explanation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. So anyway, I know we have, I hope people will look at that enough of Bet Betty and Barney yeah. and move on. Well, before we move out of the Betty and Barney Hill, uh, one one last thing sure. is I, I do believe that Lee Spiegel uncovered a report at Pease Air Force Base separately from the report that was given, but uh, something on radar that same evening. Right. Do you know anything about that? I'm not a super expert on it. Uh, yeah. People have claimed over the years that there is co uh, corroborating radar, um, yeah. but I've also read some descriptions of it that make it feel like there may have been a radar sighting of something, but it doesn't necessarily corroborate the time and place. So oh, it, it's not a smoking yeah. gun is, you know, um, Betty's dress and some of the scientific work done on the dress is probably more of a smoking gun than the, the radar return. Yeah. What about, uh, again, before we move on, yeah, uh, sure. the, 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 uh, de uh, the detractors or the debunkers, um, you know, saying that she saw a, uh, a light, on top of a sign, you know, a restaurant sign or yeah, that, a pumpkin I mean, or, or, okay. or something. Uh, well, let, you know, how do you address those, uh, the debunkers, I guess? Let's, well, case by case, fact by fact. Uh, yeah. I, I, there's nothing wrong with being skeptical. I'm skeptical of things and you're skeptical. And particularly when you're talking about something as extraordinary as the existence of other life in the universe coming here to our planet, you better be skeptical. It's a big ask for people. So um, I, the way I try to deal with uh, skeptics is with respect um, and dialogue. The mm -hmm. way I would deal with debunkers is different. Someone who appears to either be paid or just all about making fun of people that have had experiences or have seen things that person I'm not on board with because they're not approaching the case or the, the whole, the whole pro the whole issue with respect. I think respect is how you decide how you're going to look at something. Right. No, no, it's, it, um, you know, I like, I liked what, you know, Stanton Friedman used to say, you know, I, I forget exactly. It was proclamation is basically, right. you know, how a lot of uh, debunking is done. And yeah, yeah I mean, uh, uh, it, and it's still the case. Uh, you know, you've shown people those articles are on my uh, medium publication, Trail of the Saucers. And just as a sidebar here, uh, the editor on Trail of the Saucers, a man named David Bates, a, 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 a journalist himself, has tackled the new Skeptical Inquirer magazine that was devoted to being uh, a skeptical look at UFOs and a debunking of UFOs. And he found so much to discuss about their kind of lame attempt at, at looking into this, that he's writing a five or six part series on it, where he's just <laughs> taking them apart piece by piece. And I urge people to look at that. We call it Twilight of the Skeptics. And uh, <laughs> the reason we call it that is I I'm personally of the belief that the the sort of the, um, you know, the, the idea that I'm skeptical because uh, uh, I'm just trying to, well, I guess I guess I'm using skeptics instead of debunkers there, but I do think there is a twilight in the skeptical look at UFOs. If the government is willing to say in a report that these things are real and they exist, then the issue isn't trying to dismiss them all anymore. The issue is trying to have a dialogue that includes 
well, they could be this extreme thing or they could be something else. Let's see if we can marshal the evidence and the data and, and learn together what we're facing. Right. And, you know, you, you look at it this way, too. If, if the government is actually coming out and saying that the three videos that, you know, are floating around, yeah. the gimbal, the go fast, and uh, what is the third one? The Tic Tac. Uh, right. If they're saying, you know, they have no explanation for those, but there are people out there that think they're smarter and are coming up with, you know, stories to what these things are. That can also, there's a guy named Chris um, Lado out there yeah. who's debunking the debunkers. You know, he's yes. a pilot himself. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad for his work. He's still very active. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about dark skies where sure. we've, we've got, we've got uh, about uh, less than 10 minutes, about nine okay. minutes or so. But uh, before that, I wanted to uh, ask you what you thought about the new uh, bill that passed uh, that they're going to be developing a UFO office. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? Well, it's all iterations of the same kind of news. I mean, the UAP task force is, you know, was sort of the replacement for ATIP. And now this new thing, if it comes, will be sort of the replacement for the task force. Yeah. So I look at the bigger picture and just say it is right and appropriate uh, for our government to be investigating. And if anything, they need to be more transparent about showing their work. And that's I what I'm all about. And I hope so. so, yeah, I think it's yeah. a, a good thing. I don't think you can ever rely anymore on the government doing everything. You know, I think that we're yeah. going to have to do some of this ourselves. Right. Yeah. I'm, 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 I did try to um, question a, someone I sent them. I actually did a voicemail, may or may not hear back. Uh, but I want to find out how much of a public report this is going to be. Well, you know, I, you right. know, because it's a yearly report, supposedly. Well, if anything, let's just state that uh, there seems to be a growing consensus of the different phases that we've been going. Phase one is admitting they're real. Well, that's what the UAP uh, report on June 25th states in plain English. Phase mm -hmm. two is we don't make them, which it also says. And phase three is we don't think Russia or China make them either. So for me, I'm all about phase four. What would phase four be? It'd be like, do the math. If they're real and we don't make them and they don't make them, somebody else makes them. Yeah. So yeah. let's get to work on figuring that part out, folks. And it's it's kind of, I've mentioned this a number of times on the show, that it's, it's a shame that they're not looking at historical facts yeah. because you think about, you know, what these things were doing, you know, 50 years ago. And they're saying, well, it still could be Chinese or Russian or whatever. And there's Here's no your uh, segue to dark skies, by the way, the historical, because I, uh, it's true. The UAP report, if you read it, makes it sound like, well, nothing was happening. And then in 2004, we started getting these reports. Exactly. Yeah. But the reality is, I would just ask anybody who thinks there's even a modicum of truth to that spin to go read Richard Dolan's fantastic books, UFOs in the National Security State. And there's several others that are great. Or read Ross Coltart's uh, In Plain Sight, uh, which just came out this year. Just the, the, the accretion of historical cases. And, and these people uh, in our past have seen things with the same technical capabilities as they're seeing with these current ones. And let me put it this way. I don't think in 1945, China even had a had an air force, right? So they certainly mm -hmm. didn't have things that could go from 80,000 feet to 50 feet. They didn't have things going 13,000 miles an hour. And I'd submit not only that, the Russians didn't and neither did we. So I think uh, one of the things that we like to do at this Trail of the Saucers is write about historical cases so that they don't get swept under the rug. And this becomes just something where you say, well, these are the cases since 2004, because, man, there are hundreds of thousands of sightings that are good sightings in the years before 2004. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 kind of funny. If I feel more, I don't know about you, but I'm because you've written about this stuff, so you're more comfortable with what they already have been for a while, I'm sure. But for me now, I'm much more comfortable talking to people about what I do, you oh. know, this UFO show. And, you know, I just talked to a guy at a hot dog stand two days ago, and he goes, you can't believe what happened to me. You know, the more people you talk to, the more you hear that 
a lot of people have a story. Well, uh, and by the way, try creating a television series about UFOs because then people know that you're not going to laugh at them and they say, hey, uh, you're the guy that did this. I had this thing happen to you. And, yeah. But in terms of how we're being treated today, it is true. I've said over the years that uh, for most of my adult life, I've been treated like the drunk uncle at the wedding. <laughs> Uh, when I start talking <laughs> about UFOs, people go, well, there goes Bryce again. He's yeah. talking about those UFOs again. So but they funny. don't say that anymore. Yeah. And in fact, uh, rather than being the drunk uncle at the wedding, I'm the guy at the wedding. Uh, well, I go to them many weddings. But if I was at a wedding, I'd be the guy people would go up to and say, tell me what's going on with this UFO thing. I was reading something the other day, but I know you know a lot about it. Tell me what you think. I get yeah. that all the time now. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. We only got a couple of minutes here, yeah. so let's talk about your anniversary of Dark Skies, sure. by the way, which is, um, you is this available? Can you watch it anywhere? Well, here's the interesting, well, you, you can, you can't stream Dark Skies, but let me just back up for 30 seconds here. Dark Skies was a television series that I created with Brent Friedman for NBC, uh, and it aired in 1996 and 97, 20 hours. Its premise was, uh, to tell the story of UFOs through the 1960s, weaving the historical events of the 60s with real people, real UFO events, and weave them together into this uh, Mobius strip of reality. Uh, it was, it's been successful among people who care about UFOs. And Martin, your question is, well, where can I watch it if I wanted to watch it right now? I wish I could say, go to Netflix where it's streaming, uh, but it's not. Uh, it is available in one of the greatest DVD sets I've ever seen. I don't make a dime, by the way, if you buy it. So there's that. Uh, you can get that DVD set from Shout Factory, which made it. You can get it on Amazon. I think it's about 30 bucks, but it's got 20 hours on it, plus uh, four hours of a documentary, plus a bunch of Easter eggs. Uh, when they actually were putting the DVD set, DVD set together, I called up Shout Factory and said, I'm not comfortable with you guys doing kind of a half-assed job on this thing uh, just to get product out. Um, I need to work with you to make sure that it's right. And they said, absolutely. And I have to say they were fantastic. So oh, good. it's it's one of the best uh, sets that you could ever get. And I'll tease it this way as an example. During Dark Skies, we were... Um, we were given a non-negotiable demand by Steven Spielberg to take 19 things out of the show uh, because he was doing Men in Black at the time. So we had to, because oh, we yes. were not as important as Steven, we had to go shoot 11 days on our pilot that, that was already done. And so on Dark Skies, it's like going to film school. You can watch the two hours that aired on NBC or you can watch the two hours that were first produced before Spielberg got his mitts into it. So it's wow. kind of an interesting thing. I highly yeah. recommend it. I hope you go find it and enjoy it and tell your friends about it. All right. Bryce, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Okay. As always, always love talking to you. See you. Thanks again. All right. You bet. <laughs> <laughs>